So how does it relate to Wordsworth's preface to lyrical ballads? Okay, so this is the 1800 preface. Let me get this off the board. See. Uh, first of all, I mean, I've already said that uh, last class that the preface to the lyrical ballads uh, was written in the second edition of uh, the lyrical ballads. The first one had no preface. Coleridge went to Wordsworth and says, you know what? The, these are extraordinarily popular and there's a genuine spiritual excitement amongst people who are reading this. They see that there's something very important here. You need to write a preface to this to explain what it is. And he asked Wordsworth to do this. Now he asked Wordsworth, I think because Wordsworth was more prolific and, and Coleridge probably believed Wordsworth to possess insights that he did not. And maybe he did at that time. But Coleridge was so bothered by what Wordsworth wrote that he thought about it for a long time and then wrote a response. I'll deal with that next time, the, the uh, Biographia Literaria. Uh, but at first, it's Wordsworth speaking on behalf of both of them. And, the, and it's the fact that he's speaking on behalf of both of them that really bothers Coleridge. You don't represent me, actually. Your view of poetry is not my view. But he didn't know that at first. So Wordsworth talks about this. So, so he says, several of my friends are anxious for the success of these poems from a belief that if the views with which they were composed were indeed realized, a class of poetry would be produced well adapted to interest mankind permanently and not unimportant in the quality and in the multiplicity of its moral relations. And on this account, so note that it's in relation to its moral relations between the self and other selves. Note also, because whenever people look at romanticism now, they immediately think relativism. Cultural relativism, moral relativism, absolute autonomy, meaning that there, every man is a judge in his own eyes, just like the end of the book of Judges. Everyone does what's right in his own eyes because of the principle of autonomy. Absolutely, there is no guidelines for it. It, it doesn't even occur to Wordsworth. He thinks that his self is exactly the same as everybody else's self, or if there are differences, they are inconsequential. In other words, the ground of objectivity is in the fact that the self is of a Christian sort. Human nature is universal. The early Enlightenment will all say this. Kant will say this. Hegel will think it as well. The fractured individual expressions, which we now have parsed out into intersectionality, where you're the sum total of your phenomenological characteristics, you know, female, black, sexual orientation, all those things, poor, speaking this language, those intersectional qualities, that's just parsing out um, uh, a term, a, a form of phenomenology and saying that affects the noumenal self. But there's still old school people like Jordan Peterson that will say, really, it is the noumenal self that's the real self. The Enlightenment is right. The noumenal self is our self. So it's the thinking thing. And maybe we can attach feelings to it, but let's not move away from a universal human nature because that's crazy. It is crazy, by the way. He's correct. It's insane. But it's an inevitable consequence of accepting that Descartes' view of human nature is the correct view of human nature. And psychology is not going to help us on this because psychology is predicated on the truth of the Geistes Wissenschaften. It arises out of that. You need a different and more radical and Christian view of human nature. That's, that's going to help you. I say Jordan Peterson's not going to aid you on this at this point. He is, he's not see the light on this. He's not even sure that God exists. <laughs> it's again, the radical Cartesian doubt. At least Descartes is in no doubt that God exists. So he can conceive of a being far greater than himself. 
That's, so that's the next step. I can conceive that I exist, and I conceive a being far greater than I exists, therefore God exists. But note that God exists as a consequence of my thinking. I'm in charge. I dictate meaning and purpose at the end of the day. I don't think, again, Descartes intends this outcome, but it, it's there in the method. Um, so he is going to uh, trace the multiplicity of its moral relations because he thinks that they are universal. He th thinks there is a universal morality. It applies to everyone. He's not going to agree to moral relativism. He would, he would be appalled at the suggestion. He doesn't want to do it, but why, might, why does he not want to do it? He is knowing that on this occasion the reader might, would look coldly upon my arguments since I might be suspected of having principally influenced by the selfish and foolish hope of reasoning him into an approbation of these particular poems. I don't want to reason him into it because the, re the reasoning method is the enlightenment method of the philosophers. I want him to feel it. He, he sees the two as opposed. Percy Shelley, in his defense of poetry, is going to latch onto this and, and present it as there's two ways of knowing. One is what he calls ta logodzein, he's using the Greek. And the other, which is the one that Wordsworth proposes, is ta poiein, from which we get the poet, as opposed to the logician. Well, what we have here then is a firewall between philosophy and poetry. One represents the Mr. Spock of the world, the philosopher, and the other represents the Counselor Troy of the world. If you're into the whole Star Trek genealogy, the one who empathizes and can feel other people's feelings really well. But they're both counselors. Which counselor will you listen to? But they don't recognize the authority of, of one another's approach to understanding the world. One's through thought, the other's through feeling. Wordsworth's feeling has a character of thought, by the way. But it is feeling. Feeling's at the center of it, and in psychology, likewise, uh, it moves in that direction from Freud onwards. But anyway, he said, in order to treat the subject with that sort of clearness and coherence, it would be necessary to give a full account of the present taste of the public taste in the country, and to determine how far this taste is healthy or depraved, which again would, could not be determined without pointing out in what manner language and the human mind act and react on each other, and without retracing the revolutions, not of literature alone, but likewise of society itself. Perhaps he's correct. You would have to include all these things. How do language and thought, how do words and thoughts relate to each other? And how does that relate to social development? But the reason he says that you couldn't resolve it is because he thinks that language um, is a social construct. That, so he's, because he's following Rousseau. And Rousseau thinks that language is a social construct rather than the fundamental uh, attribute, communicable, communicable attribute of God which human beings share. We also can speak. And our words relate to the word, the capital W word. And there's great beauty in the word. So he doesn't want to do that. Uh, and yet, he doesn't want to give up the task. So what does he do? He wants to talk about this revolution in poetry, and he'll talk about it in these terms. The principal object in these poems was to choose incidents and situations from common life and to relate or describe them throughout as far as was possible in a selection of language really used by men, and at the same time to throw over them a certain coloring of imagination whereby ordinary things should be presented to the mind in an unusual aspect, and further and above all, to make those incidents and situations interesting by tracing them truly, though not ostentatiously, the primary laws of our nature, 
What are the primary laws of our nature? So he's getting down, we're getting to the root of the things. What is the primary laws of our nature? Huh, what would you think of a man following Rousseau? Chiefly, as far as regards the manner in which we associate ideas in a state of excitement. Huh? Why would that be the case? Because that's where our emotions are involved. That's where the association of the ideas are closest to the source is when our feelings are provoked. So let's go to the feeling in the ideas that underlie the words. But note this and connect it back to what I said about Rousseau and the origin of language, human language being in grunts and cries, passionate outpourings, which then we come up with as a group, come up with words to describe. But feeling becomes the arbiter of, of right and wrong, a good word or a bad word. So we can start banning words because they don't represent our feelings. And we can start pr prescribing, you have to use this word because it expresses our feelings as a culture. You can't say this, you must say that because it, it best represents the feelings. And the feelings determine whether reality is really real because feeling is at the center of our being. We're all romantics in this sense, or our culture is rather. So it's the ideas in a state of excitement where the feelings are preeminent. Now, having said that, you could think that would be everywhere, wherever we get excited. But he goes a step further. Humble and rustic life was generally chosen because in that condition, the essential passions of the heart, again, note that this is the primary criteria, the essential passions of the heart is going to determine good and bad language. They find a better soil in which they can attain their maturity. They're under less restraint and speak a plainer and more emphatic language because in that condition of life, our elementary feelings, elementary feelings, it coexist in a state of greater simplicity and consequently may, may be more accurately contemplated and more forcibly communicated. It, there's a chain of logic here. Our feelings are most clear most um, untrammeled by complexity, more simple, more accurate, more forcibly communicated. Why? Because the manners of rural life germinate from those elementary feelings. Note again, it's always going back to elementary feelings. What is the most basic thing? It's our elementary feelings. And what are those elementary feelings? Go back to Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. That will develop out of this. That's just the scientific codification of the, this idea that our selves are related to elementary feelings. And from the necessary character of rural occupations are more easily comprehended, are more durable, and lastingly, because in that condition, the passions of men are incorporated with the beautiful and permanent forms of nature. Okay, so it all has a justification based on the legitimacy of strong elemental passions, which is now the center of poetics. Right, so it's based on a certain view of language. That, so the lecture, a class or two, goes absolutely necessary. You have to see that first. Then how does it play out in poetics? Well, now well, he's going to talk about it. The language, too, of these men has been adopted because such men hourly communicate with the best objects from which the best part of language is originally derived. The best objects from which the best part of language is originally derived. Well, what is that? It's in relation to nature, not culture. Again, he's influenced by Rousseau, who is, regards society as trammeling his sense of himself. It's causing him to be inauthentic and Rousseau prizes above all things authenticity, being true to himself. Follows Hamlet's dictum. Only be true to thyself, and thou shalt not do any man wrong. You have to be true to yourself. So you have to decide who you are and not follow in anyone 
anyone else's footsteps and be like Immanuel Kant, follow his dictum on what is enlightenment, dare to know, dare to be your authentic self. You can self-author yourself. That's a daring path. So says Jordan Peterson. Self-authoring software, etc. Right? It is, actually. And it's the standard advice that's been given since the Enlightenment. It's based on a flawed pedagogy, a flawed view of human nature, a meaningless, purposeless existence that we give meaning and purpose to. And um, the question is, can it ever attain the objectivity that it claims to if it doesn't accord with the way that things actually are? And the answer is no, it can't. It simply can't. You can be authentically wrong. <laughs> be very authentic. There are a lot of very authentic wrong people. They're actually, they're called heretics. They truly believe that they were right and they departed from the truth and they became false teachers, which the New Testament warns us about constantly. Above all things, avoid the false teachers. They're the ones that will kill the soul. Just like the Pharisees, beware those that will kill the soul, never mind those that will kill the body. But the, those who will kill the soul, those are the ones you need to watch out for. So he will go to this. And accordingly, such a language. Why? Because they convey their feelings and notions in a simple and unelaborated expression. So we have the ideal, idealization of the peasant and the rustic and the native. Last the Mohicans, Cooper, totally predicated on this idea that the native, the noble savage, as Rousseau calls him, is a better, more wise individual than the educated culture that encounters them. It's the idealization of the no noble savage. Accordingly, such a language arising out of repeated experience and regular feelings, note this, how it language comes from, it comes from the feelings, it could not be more clear, is a more permanent and a more philosophical language than that which is frequently substituted for by poets who think they are conferring honor upon themselves in their art in proportion as they separate themselves from the sympathies of men. In other words, in accordance to the way in which they follow the rules of poetry, which we can call artifice. Wordsworth, on, on the other hand, is going to fit in with the whole querelle des anciens et des modernes. He's going to say it's not what the ancients say and the rules of Aristotle and the neoclassical poetical traditions. It's not art, it's nature. Wordsworth will over and over and over again circle around nature and contrast it from artifice. Because artifice is something you have to learn. Horse calls it the Ars Poetica, the art of poetry. It's a way, and the way is already established. You have to learn the way. Now Longinus, go back to Longinus, said that the, the, the most sublime poetry is based on something that is actually what we would attribute to nature. Grandeur of thoughts, nobility of expression, those two things. And he says that I can't teach those. Uh, in a sense, although you can model them. And hence you read great, the minds of great men. And you have before you the examples of great individuals. Hence Paideia, hence the mentor, hence the father. The father is uh, absolutely crucial in the education of the children, in the lives of the children, the character of the father. Wordsworth will make no mention of fathers whatsoever. His, his heroes are all orphaned, just like he was, by the way. He was orphaned at 10. Very hard. If you read the history of uh, the great men in intellectual life, and Paul Witz has done this, by the way. There's an interesting book on this. It's a psychologist, and he talks about this very phenomenon. If you're interested in this, how many of them were orphans themselves? And from that vantage point, spoke authoritatively about something that actually they had no authority to 
speak about, which is education. Because the qualification for a, an elder is to be a father. And to talk about it in that relation, not from the perspective of the child. Wordsworth says the child is the father of the man, tellingly. It's the children's perspective which we need to take. So education becomes, what does little Johnny like doing? And let's let little Johnny do what little Johnny wants to do in directing his own life and so forth. That you're a career, and you get a career counselor saying, Johnny, what do you like to do? Oh, I like to do this. OK, well then, Johnny, you should do that. But my father has a business, and he wants me to do my bi you know, follow in the family business. Well, you shouldn't do that, Johnny, because is that what you really want to do? No, well then. Johnny, you should ignore <laughs> the fact that you've been handed a, a stake in the family business and you're going to take over from your father. Be true to yourself. Right? Don't honor your father and mother. Honor yourself. Don't think of the implications of your actions. Be courageous. Dare to know yourself. It's just like you can see. Nobody here is named Johnny, so I can, nobody will think I'm getting at them personally. Um, but note that as the, the poets before separated them from the sympathies of man, and sympathies of man are connected to nature. Right? And the path of artifice is artificial. It's, it's distance. It's abstract. It's a lot more like ra the rationality of the Enlightenment. So this is a polemic against traditional poetic language and the whole Western tradition, quite frankly, even though Wordsworth himself would, would have been schooled in it and clearly knows it. He's read widely. Because he says, there's nothing more dishonorable to the writer's own character than false refinement or arbitrary innovation. That's true. But the arbitrary innovation is Wordsworth's poetics. <laughs> And it is the Cartesian no notion of human nature. That's the arbitrary innovation, that the self is the person. And it will destroy your character. There's no virtue that's going to guide you. The, the goodness, whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is noble, whatever is these things do. Well, those are fixed virtues that everyone has historically recognized. C.S. Lewis, Lewis calls them the Tao. And if a writer's character rejects that and comes up with arbitrary innovations, then it will um, dishonor the poet. And we can see the fruit of that because nobody reads any contemporary poetry anymore because it's disconnected from beauty, goodness, truth, honor, justice, all those things. And not just that, the humanities in general. It's followed a different path. OK, so. From such verses, the poems in these volumes will be found distinguished at least by one mark of difference, that each of them has a worthy purpose. Now, isn't that interesting? Not that I always write with a distinct purpose formerly conceived, but habits of meditation have I trust. So it's a purposiveness without purpose is what he describes here. So I couldn't have an intention to write it with this outcome in mind. It just sort of happens organically without my thought. I'm trusted and ha because a purpose is a rational cause and effect thing. And again, I don't want to go down there. I will be what? Prompted and regulated my feelings that in my description of subjects are strongly excite those feelings will be found to carry along with them with the per So the purpose comes with the feelings. The feelings will direct the purpose. Again, it's a certain view of language. It's consistent in this. Following the postulate of Rousseau, and others on the origin of language being feeling. And feeling will direct every meaning and purpose. So he goes on this. And he says, if this opinion be erroneous, I can have little right to the name of a poet. Uh-oh. The opinion is erroneous. His friend Coleridge will call him a great poet in spite of his theory, in spite of himself. He says, still a great poet, actually. However, his theory is abysmal. It could not be worse. But anyway, why, 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 why? For all good poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. 
everything I've just said up to this point, summarized in a pithy little statement. All good poetry is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. And though this be true, I will just take it as given. Poems to which any value can be attached were never produced on any variety of subjects by, by a man who, being possessed of more than unusual organic sensibility, had also thought long and deeply. Okay, so you got to have deep feelings and you have to have thought on them repeatedly. But note the, the definition. All good po poetry is the spontane spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. Words, uh, Coleridge is going to go after this, this definition, because we finally have something like a definition. Although he's danced around and he's already articulated it, actually. First of all, he's, he's going to say it's not all good poetry. It might be some. Secondly, even that's not true because <laughs> there's a lot more to it than that, especially what we would call great poetry. It's dealt with other subject matters. Thirdly, I won't even get into Coleridge's rebuttal of this, but I'll do that next time. But he talks about this organic sensibility. So it's the sensitive poet, sensitive to feeling, others' feelings and his feelings. And imagination will be connected to a feeling empathetic capacity, which I actually happen to think is a valuable attribute in people, myself, being sensitive to other people's feelings and nuance and so forth and reading a room when you're talking, talking to an individual actually recognizing whether they're with you or totally against you and why that is and being able to recognize that you're reading your audience, you're engaging with your audience, that's part of the process for sure. But is the feeling the arbiter of right and wrong? No, that can't be the case at the end of the day. If somebody's really messed up, they need you to pull them out of their feelings, not be drawn into their feelings. That's a world of confusion for them. You need to pull them out of that and point them towards something that is objective and true and real. And that will mean that they're rescued from their sense of hopelessness and meaninglessness. That's the problem of our day. Hopelessness and meaninglessness, hence suicides, hence drug overdoses, hence, hence all sorts of abuse to oneself and other people. It's that sense of loss of meaning and purpose. The loss of meaning and purposeness that went when the uh, cosmos was discarded and all of the world that was connected to that. So, for our continued influxes of feeling are modified and directed by our thoughts. Note that the thoughts come after the feelings. And as by contemplating the relation of those, these general representatives to each other, general representatives of feelings, we discover what is really important to men. So by the repetition and continuance of this act, our feelings will be connected with important subjects Till at length, if we be originally possessed of much sensibility, if, so first of all, we have to be a very feeling sensitive individual, ground zero, such habits of mind will be produced that by obeying blindly and mechanically the impulses of these habits, we shall describe the objects and utter sentiments of such a nature and in such connection with each other that the understanding of the reader must necessarily be in some degree enlightened and his affections, most importantly of all, strengthened and purified. We will have a new birth, a new being in front of us. He describes it in the um, Tinter Nabi. We become a living soul, he talks about it. We become, there's a new birth. It's through the, the pneuma of the spirit and the spirit related to the feeling and back and forth between that and it leads people to a spiritual it is a new religious viewpoint and the poet in this is a sort of a god it has been mentioned that these have each of these poems as a purpose another circumstance must be mentioned which distinguishes these poems from the popular poetry of the day it is that the feeling therein developed gives importance to the action in the situation and not the action in situation to the feeling. Okay, further implication of this. Again, let's not get our feelings out of order. Feelings are normally seen as a consequence of actions. But we, if we're going to get this revolution right, we need to put things in the right ordering. Feelings are paramount. 
the actions flow from the feelings, but at the end of the day, the actions are forgivable. They're not the means of justice. If I punch you because you made me angry, we have to, we have to address the root causes of the fact that I punched you. And what are the root causes? Well, I was angry. Okay, why were you angry? Well, then we have to get into my psychology and my social background. And all of that will be to move judgment away from treating other people as other people. Because ultimately, feelings which are common are the real realm of justice now. It doesn't matter if I punched you in the nose and broke your nose. That, it, it does matter, but the root cause of it, we have to get to that. How did the feelings get disordered? And we, if we can solve that problem, then we will get out of this cycle of injustice and violence. And so the solution, which uh, in general has been taken since the Romantics, is to address the Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. We have to give you food, clothing, shelter. If you don't have it, that's the root cause of the anger and frustration. I think it might be one of the causes, but it's not the root cause. They say it's always the root cause. But note this, so the shifting there, because actions, again, think murder. You murder somebody, this is a, a heinous offense. You've taken the life of another person who bears the image of God. That's an action, you will be punished accordingly for it. But if the murder is, and the action is not the most significant thing, but the thing that gave rise to the action, then the whole criminal justice system is gonna get reoriented accordingly. And following Wordsworth, it will. So we'll get into moving away from retributive justice, which is how the old way of looking at justice would, was, is described, and move towards re rehabilitative justice. That's what the prison system does, by the way. The penitentiary system there is to, uh, to set you in a prison and let you be penitent and meditate on what you did wrong, and then you will rise out of that and be a better person. That's why the whole penitentiary system arose in the belief that if we just have time to ourselves and cool down and get a little counseling, we'll come out of it less angry and be better. It's not, it's not, it's not there in Roman law, it's not there in biblical law, the idea of putting people in a cell and acting them to reflect on their deeds and emerge a better person after the sentence has been reduced because of good behavior, whatever. This is not a, this is a broken model. It was always broken, actually. I think it's unjust to the people, myself, even the, even the criminals. But that's another topic. But that arises, that sort of thinking arises from this sort of sense. So, um, so the spontaneous, uh, or rather the overflow of powerful feelings. But why this time? He did say society should be a consideration if he's gonna do a proper theory of poetics. He says, I'm not gonna go into that. But then he does go into it, right here. The human mind is capable of being excited without the application of gross and violent stimulants, and he must have a very faint perception of its beauty and dignity who does not know this, and who does not further know that one being is elevated above another in proportion as he possesses this capability of being able to discern with uh, subtlety. It, and this is the problem that coarsened sensibility is gonna be the problem. So if the solution is having more finely sensitive, emotionally aware, by the way, they call it EQ these days, you can do an EQ test, and your emotional awareness is something that is today prized because we're all romantics in leadership. Above IQ, you got EQ, IQ, 
I, I, don't, I don't wholly dismiss EQ, by the way, but again, the idea that EQ is the solution to good leadership is to say the romantics are right, that every, at the root of all leadership is having the right feelings and expressing your feelings rightly. But, it, but the problem Wordsworth identifies is we have a society that is full of coarse people, unfeeling people, callous people. And why is that? Well, because a multitude of causes unknown to former times are now acting with a combined force to blunt the discriminating powers of the mind and unfitting it for all voluntary exertion to reduce it to a state of almost savage torpor. We're unfit to think clearly or feel rightly. What are these events, this multitude of causes? Well, the most effective of these causes are the great national events which are daily taking place, the news, and the increasing accumulation of men in cities where the uniformity of their occupations produces a craving for extraordinary incident. We want even more news. Bring me something new because my life is monotonous, tedious, repetitive, and divorced from nature and divorced from real feelings. I'm around, surrounded in a little box in the sky in a condo by people I don't know and I don't even know my neighbor's name and I don't care. And he doesn't care about me. I could die in the streets and no one would bat an eye. To this tendency of life and manners, and this is in the accumulation of men in cities, cities, cities are, are not bad per se, they're bad because they have an effect on people's feelings for one another. To this tendency of life and manners of the literature and theatrical ex exhibitions of the country have conformed themselves, the invaluable works of our elder writers, I'd almost said the works of Shakespeare and Milton, are driven into s neglect by frantic novels, sickly and stupid German tragedies, and d deluges of idle and extravagant stories and verse. When I think upon this degrading thirst after outrageous stimulation, we could add to it in our day, action movies, video games, social media, constant stimulation, constant connection, but divorce from, so you're doing your social media on TikTok or whatever with the person sitting right beside you and you're not willing to talk to that person. You're using that medium because it, it, it's psychologically addictive because it clicks and it buzzes and whatever, it notifies you. And if somebody likes it, you feel pepped up oh, people like me, I feel accepted and included, my autonomous self is, is not, I'm not just to myself, people actually like me. Oh, that's a firm affirmation, but if they put the thumbs down, and they decide to pile on me, my life is meaningless. I want to be an influencer. It's my way of self-affirmation. But he says, when I think about this degrading thirst after outrageous simulation, I am almost ashamed to have spoken of the feeble endeavor made in these volumes to counteract it. And reflecting on the magnitude of the general evil, I should be oppressed with no dishonorable melancholy had I not a deep impression of certain inherent and indestructible qualities of the human mind. I'm convinced of the holiness of the heart's affections, says Keats, of nothing else. He's convinced because Wordsworth taught him to be convinced of the holiness of the heart's affections beauty and truth. And he is, he is firmly convinced of that. Now, this is not a postmodernist view. Very, it's, he says it's objective, it's real, and it can guide all of us. So, so it's, don't jump to the 200-year downstream consequence of Wordsworth's move towards autonomy and feeling. We see that very clearly. He doesn't. But it is the effect of it, is what I call the crisis of self-legitimation. You keep coming back to yourself, and that self, as it finds that other selves are actually different, lacks any legitimacy, and so you keep trying to find ways of patching the Cartesian notion of autonomous selfhood. And you can come up with new ones, identity groups, so I'll identify with the group. And the group's not good enough because that group is all women, but I'm a black woman, and white women don't really understand a black woman, so I'll, I'll, 
parse it out further and, and black women, but there and then there are black women that aren't lesbians. I'm, an, I'm a black woman lesbian, so I also have to have that characteristic. Now we have the whole intersectional portrait of all of those things to try and cover and fix the patch of autonomous selfhood. And then what you get with that is the moral and cultural relativism of our, of our day. But that's way downstream from this. That's the subject matter of next semester. We'll have to get into that because that's what our current literary, um, the, the, that's the uh, world of the humanities right now. It's mired in that solution, a bad solution to a uh, problem which they assume to be correct but has demonstrated itself to be impossible and a failure. So my purpose, once again, just to reiterate himself, was to imitate as far as possible and to adopt the very language of men. And assuredly, such personifications do not make any natural or regular part of that language. They are indeed a figure of speech, occasionally prompted by passion, and I've made use of them as such. But he wants to move towards the real language of men. What does that mean? It is a it really begs the question, what, what on earth do you mean by that? He talks about it in relation to nature, he talks about it in relation to feelings, etc. Coleridge is going to ask, we'll see this next time, if it's in relation to nature, then you would have thought that the people who are surrounded by more extravagant, uh, sublime instances of nature than we find in the northwest of England, like in the jungle, of Africa would have better language and better poetry, but we find that it isn't the case. And we find that the most central aspects of human language, indispensable, uh, derive not from relations to nature, but from the pulpit, from people who've been transformed by the word of God. So he's gonna push it away from this. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about Mr. Coleridge more next time. Do you have any questions here? I, I spoke, as usual, rather breathlessly in the gap here. Yes? The conception of um, spirit, or the... Um, geist. Yeah, the geist. In a small g. Yeah, which Hegel picks up, and which is illustrated by a lot of the... There's the high of geist. Yep. No, it's, they, they have a sense of, it's the progressive emancipation from matter is what it is. Because, again, it's, it's noumenological, uh, phenomenological. Those are Kantian categories. And it's moving away from the phenomena, the physical being uh, that we can see and perceive, the, the appearance, phenomena refers to the, the appearance of things, and moving more towards the reality that, uh, the sign, which are the phenomena, points to. It's moving closer to that. That's what progress is. So when they say we're, we're progressives, we're becoming more progressive, what does that actually mean? Well, we don't look at it from, uh, we can't see it, we can only see it looking backwards. It's progress from something. It's not towards anything. That's the thing that they never say, what, what are we making progress towards? We, we live in a progressive world, do we? Where are we going then? Oh, we're not, we're not, uh, we can't answer that question. It's a purposiveness without purpose. It's an emancipation from all prejudice. It's an emancipation from matter, everything phenomenological. A wholly noumenal realm. Artificial intelligence is unthinkable without these prior, um, Steps, by the way. Which the whole of human society now seems dependent on. Modeling, forecasting of outcomes in computer models directed the whole pandemic response. Like, and if you put the wrong numbers in, then you get, a, you get the wrong outcome. Doesn't matter, we so trust in the science 
or rather in the numbers that uh, we're willing because we, see of our, we, we conceive of ourselves in a noumenal sense that we were willing to trust something that was plainly irrational. But yes, that's an answer. It doesn't, you can't see, they don't see what you're progressing towards. The plausibility structure exists in saying, this is what we're progressing from. And so it would involve a denigration of the past. So that this was wrong and we're, we're, we're not gonna repeat that. And the way we're not gonna repeat it is whatever, X, Y, Z. We're not gonna repeat the errors of history and by not, by doing, so it's conceived in a negative sense. We won't do that and that will make the progress. So it's an anti-traditional approach. It, it, that's the progress actually. If you wanna see the marks of progress, we've got rid of all the old books. We've got rid of the Bible at the center of the education system. We've got rid of the idea of revelation as having primacy over, the, over understanding human life. We're gonna use the principle of autonomy and apply it resolutely. And the more we rebel against the past, against our even physical bodies, because remember now the gender identity activists will talk about themselves being determined at birth, their identity that was assigned, assigned at birth. It was a sign, but it was a sign that they did not authorize. So when you said I was a, a boy, because you saw physical boy parts, and the doctor says it's a boy, mom and dad said, oh, it's a boy, let's call him little Johnny. And then little Johnny says, no, my name is Juliet, because you assigned me that, that sexual identity at birth, but I didn't do it, and that's not who I authentically am. Now you can see, right? It's an appeal to romantic authenticity and the alleged allegedly more authentic reality of my feelings, which may be at odds with my, what everyone else can see, but we so strongly believe in progress that we're willing to con ignore what we see with our very own eyes, because it's the method of doubt, which is the basis of modern certitude. Anyway.